Hey everyone, this is Mark Patton, Jesse from Nightmare on Elm Street 2, and you're listening to Elm Street Radio. You are all my Elm Street Radio listeners now. Mwaha! Hi there, Nightmare fans. Deandra here. Paige is not here, unfortunately, and I dearly miss her. But she's traveling, and so it is just me and you and our special guest this week, Mr. Mark Patton. I absolutely cannot wait for Mark. He has been an inspiring, raw influence in the nightmare community in the horror community as a whole and in the lgbt community he i adore him and i cannot wait to see what kind of conversations we have with him but before we take our trip to elm street there are a couple of things to talk about this week on elm street radio first There was that whole thing we talked about previously with the A Nightmare on Elm Street remake synopsis with the government agency mumbo-jumbo. Well, guess what? Good news, it's bogus. Completely false. Of course, IMDb. Anybody can pretty much add anything to IMDb. So uh, whoever came up with that, hopefully they don't go into filmmaking. (laughs) Just kidding. Maybe, maybe not. But David Leslie Johnson who penned the Nightmare reboot, is still pretty much in the works for another Nightmare film. Now, Nightmare is kind of being put on the back burner right now because New Line is focusing on the Conjuring universe and the upcoming two-part adaptation of It. They're pretty busy, and we just might see... Elm Street down the road. I would love to see an Elm Street game, kind of like the way that Friday the 13th is, mostly from graphics and different elements incorporated into it. Maybe you can play as Nancy, maybe you can play as Freddy, maybe you can create your own character, follow the storyline, and maybe Nancy pops up to help you from the dream world and the beautiful dream. Who knows? Something that would be awesome like that. Plus, if we could get Robert to voice Freddy... That would be cool. Not that somebody else couldn't do it, but I know that would mean a lot to a lot of fans. But hey, I'm open to anything. Just give me a nightmare game that's done well. And I've been reflecting on the Mixtron interview since last week. I don't know about you guys. I'm curious to hear what your favorite parts are. But I keep laughing about Nancy's streak and the committee. And everything that he talked about last week was quite interesting and honest and I I loved hearing his story about Rachel Talale how (laughs) how he didn't really know that Nightmare had this huge impact she's like yeah of course it does and then lo and behold you know Mick finds out and now he's out and about and he's making his way through the crowd and and the way he's talking to our Nightmare fans is reminds me of the way that Mark Patton has been very open very honest very very talkative and and very down-to-earth and humble you know there's not that separation they don't not respond to you they talk to you like a friend like a Facebook friend or a Twitter friend or an Instagram friend so I love talking to Mick keep loving talking to him and I'm I'm really excited about Mark Patton as you know he has the Scream Queen documentary that's coming out and that's going to be talking about not only everything that goes on with Nightmare 2 and Nightmare 2 itself but also the symbolism behind it the impact that it has people who don't like it maybe and maybe who do like it and maybe maybe there will be some familiar faces and maybe some not and who knows who we'll hear from from the films and I'm very much looking forward to it. It has been in production for some time, but quality is better, and I, it makes me only all the more excited to see Scream Queens because I, I have the utmost faith in everything that Mark does. Um, not that I need any faith in him, but I know that he is insightful and inspiring and not afraid to tear down some barriers and make some waves and really open people's eyes. I I think Scream Queens is going to leave a huge impact on the world and 
oh, I'm getting this weird tingly feeling like maybe it's time for me to take my hypnoso because I think we're going to be heading to Elm Street. So Nightmare fans, let's get ready for Jesse Walsh himself, Mark Patton. We need you, Jesse. We got special work to do here, you and me. You've got the body. I've got the brain. Hello, Elm Street fans. It's that time again where we head back to 1428 and welcome this week's guest, Jesse Walsh himself, Mark Patton. Hi, Mark. Hey, Deandra. How are you doing? It's nice to be back on Elm Street. I am doing awesome. It is such a pleasure to have you on with us today. How is everything going for you? Oh, thanks. Well, I'm, you're talking to me. I'm in Chicago right now, in my house in Chicago. And, uh, you know, it's the 4th of July and all that. So everything's going really well. I have this month to, I've had a break in my convention schedule for the last month. So I'm getting ready to head back out on the road to Crypticon in about 10 days. So I'm looking forward to that. But I enjoyed my vacation. I enjoyed the, the hot uh, Illinois summer. <laughs> Well, that's awesome to hear that you've been uh, keeping busy because I know that everybody who goes to conventions loves to meet with you. And it's really interesting to, you know, look at how things have progressed over the years, how everybody in the very beginning was like, where's Mark Patton? And then you emerged and you've been very active in the community for such a long time talking to everybody and everybody just loves to meet with you and it's really interesting and to hear all these stories about fans who value Jesse so much I mean when you hear them talking to you about how you and the character have changed their life what what does that feel like what's what's your reaction to that well sometimes it you know it's a very interesting experience Dee um you know, when I first came back on the convention scene, I, I really didn't know anything. You know, I mean, I didn't know about this world. I didn't know about conventions or how um, intense the horror community could be or how tight it was. So that was a nice surprise for me. And, um, and I did have a, you know, I came into this world with a plan of how I was going to approach my you know, my newfound fame. And I just put those plans into action and, and now I'm living with the consequences of that. And, and I'm really happy with, you know, basically I'm very happy with it. Um, my fan base is, uh, you know, it's pretty specific and, um, I mean, it goes all over the, all over the map, but the, the relationships are usually pretty intense and, um, the connection is, is pretty intense. So sometimes it's, uh, it's very joyful, of course, and uh, and humbling. And sometimes it's heartbreaking, you know, because some of the stories I hear are really heartbreaking. But um, but and I've learned so much, you know, over these past years about Elm Street. That's been the real um, uh, eye opener for me. Because to be honest with you, I really didn't understand for a long time what people saw in these films. I mean, it just, it was, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street was just basically a home movie for me. So um, as it is, those kind of things are for most actors. I mean, you just see your yourself in it. You don't see it historically and you don't see when people identify it as intensely as people do with Elm Street. What the point is, I mean, I, I had so many questions as I went along. I, I never understood why people, you know, really identified with Freddy Krueger as opposed to say Nancy or Jesse, um, uh, Alice, you know, like Heather, me, Lisa, Amanda, the, I, my natural instinct would be good to go. Those would be the people that you would be more interested in where the people who really identified with Freddie, I, I just, I really didn't understand them. And I didn't understand the, the concept of the dream world 
until I had some personal experiences that I was like, oh my God, this is what they're talking about. This is why these people identify with this movie. For me, it was seeing another, a different series. I saw this, uh, this series on, uh, on Netflix called The OA, and which is the, the original Angel, I think it's one season. And I so was sucked into this world of the creators of this thing. And um, it was about compartmentalizing your dreams and your personality and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, oh my God, this is how people feel about Elm Street. So the minute I had that key, I could sort of unlock that, that door. And now I understand it certainly a whole lot better than, and then of course, through filming all these years, um, I've learned a lot about Elm Street. So, you know, it's, it's been a, it's been an amazing journey. It, it is really interesting. I, I can somewhat identify with that having, I mean, even though I'm a big fan, I grew up in a household that was very conservative and we didn't watch horror movies and I was terrified of everything, but I'd always had some kind of passion for something in entertainment, but I just could not, I didn't know that there was any sort of passionate fandom behind the nightmare films until I started to talk to people on forums and then Facebook started to grow and now it's just you see all these stories from all over and it's pretty amazing and the thing about that too is that I mean we all know and I know that everybody listening has heard the things you know the, the relationship with the whole franchise in Nightmare 2 but Nightmare 2 is almost like a cult film on its own with the fans that it has and that I've seen come out loving the way that Freddy is, loving Jesse, loving the special effects and everything that goes on with the movie. And I honestly believe that you coming out and talking to everybody and expanding on Jesse's universe has been an integral piece in really strengthening the meaning to fans that Nightmare 2 holds as as a contribution to the franchise oh well thank you you know I, I i agree because i on a certain level because i did put a face to uh the conversation and i wasn't really afraid to have the conversation and i'm still not do you know what i mean i still get it's you know it's very interesting my friend ruth and i were talking today and we went for a walk and we were talking about you know it was just gay pride and all of that kind of stuff and i of course get all the men's from everybody, uh, our memes, how do you say it? For, you know, <laughs> celebrating like sort of the gay queer aspect of Nightmare on Elm Street. And I put up one of uh, on my Instagram account, which is Mark Patton, N-O-E-S-2, in case you wanna join me there. Um, <laughs> and I put up a, you know, like it was a picture of Robert, a uh, Freddie in a rainbow colored sweater. And I got this really lengthy, you know, irate email from, um, a fan who was, you know, he was really hateful. And he said, so, you know, like, Freddie's not gay and Robert's not gay and you gay people try to own everything and blah, 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 blah. And please take this down. And, oh, wow. you know, the only way I could respond to him was like, well, A, I know Robert a lot better than you do. So <laughs> I yes. kind of know how he feels about those things. And so the really offense, I mean, Freddy Krueger is a, is a pedophile child molester serial killer. <laughs> you know, what What part of that don't you get? You know what I mean? I mean, it's a movie, but that's who he is. You know what I mean? It's like, why does it offend you that he's got a rainbow t-shirt on now? Um, or that people identify with this? And of course, we're so far down the road with that now that we all, you know, you all know a totally different story than we did seven or eight years ago. And of course, you're going to know a, a a deeper version of that story uh, very shortly because the long awaited scream queen is about ready to hit you. And, um, and you know, that it's a very, very, uh, deep conversation. Cause it is, you know, basically it is a standalone movie. It, it stands alone by all itself. I was just at the, uh, you know, I was just at the Alamo draft house in New York city and, yeah. um, they, it, the, the film was sold out for like two months before it, you, you couldn't get a ticket to it. And I do like a symposiums. So I do those all over the country now. And, you know, a lot for gay and lesbian uh, organizations. I'm going to be at FlameCon in New York in 
August with Felissa. Felissa, Rose, and I have sort of become a tag team. Um, we we kind of go every place together. <laughs> you know, Sleepaway Camp <laughs> and Nightmare on Elm Street 2 go together very well. You know what? You're right. Camp. They do. I had not thought, but they, they most certainly, they absolutely do. Yeah, so we have a lot of fun with that. And I enjoy it. I mean, I, I would be less than honest if I didn't say my feelings don't get hurt sometimes, because they do, you know? I mean, there's occasions where I'm just like, I can't really figure things out, you know, socially in the convention world, because there's still a lot of negativity about Nightmare on Elm Street, too. I know that. It's not, you know, there are many conventions I'm not invited to. And um, and I wonder why. And then after I try one or two times to, you know, to make myself available to them and they don't want me, then I just have to chalk it up to, you know, I don't want to go to any party that, you know, people are not going to invite me to. And um, so, and I get that quite a bit. I mean, I'll go, to, I'll see conventions where five or six Elm Street people are going to be there. And so, or, so it, it, you know, so you just have to suck that up. I also get invited to other places that otherwise I wouldn't be invited to, you know, so I just try to balance that out. I mean, I've gone to the Metropolitan Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, the Tate in London, and all in the back of Nightmare on Elm Street. So, so there are, I get invited to the pretty swanky parties, I have to say. So, and I do, and I go all over the world. So, you know, I, I, I want to see the glass as half full as opposed to, that, you know, half empty. So, yeah, I can, I can imagine, you know, uh, hearing some of the things that people have to say, because people can be so terrible. Um, oh, you know that, yes. We both know that, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it, it's rough and you want to be positive and you want to put on tough skin, but really, I mean, it's human nature to feel some sort of hurt to a certain level, even if you are tough at that point in time or, or however you feel about yourself. It is, it is, it is pretty tough, but like you said, you've been to all of these places and I really think it's not, it, it you've, you alone have changed the whole face of how people look at Nightmare 2 and how people are looking at it as a film and how they're looking at you. Not only Nightmare 2, but Mark Patton. They're looking at you. They want you. Yes, you were Nightmare 2. Yes, it is a groundbreaking horror film for the LGBT community, but you have been this incredible role model out there for the community yourself and being outspoken in the way you treat people it is a model and I've, I've spoken to several people who were at conventions before and they're wondering you know what can I do to get invited to more conventions what can I do to become more popular anything of that nature and I always bring up the Mark Patton method I don't I I I I, I don't no, if they take my advice, I think a lot of them do, but I, you know, there's this example that, that you've set for yourself for, for how you take the film that you've been in and, and take your role and you really own it. And it's awesome. Oh, well, thank you. Do you know, that's so, that's great. Cause I was, I was in Texas not too long ago and, um, and I'm getting ready to go to Syracuse now for a film festival, a Nightmare on Elm Street film festival. And I, uh, and I do sit with people who, interestingly enough, like they denigrate their own work. And um, I find that really interesting, you know, because like for me, say Nightmare on Elm Street 2, right? When I was making the movie, I was very proud of that movie. I've always been really proud of it. I'm proud of my work in it. I did absolutely the best that I could do when knowing what I knew at the time, you know? And I hear people, you know, talk about their films and they're like, oh, you know, I just walked through that and, or, oh, I, I hate these or this or that. Or, you know, specifically, it's interesting, like, because I think, you know, it's like we segue off a little bit on like to, uh, you know, Screen Queen, My Nightmare on Elm Street uh, has been a very long journey for me. And I know you know that because you were, you know, in on the the conception of it really yeah. at the beginning and it's been we've been filming and editing for three years and and we're uh, it's finished I mean the um, they just screened an hour and 20 minutes of the film last week wow. Wow. and um you know this is like the budget of this is insane I mean it's hundreds of thousands of dollars 
And you made documentaries, so you know what's entailed in that. But this is you added the the added part of this is ours is all factual. And it's so there's immense amount of lawyers involved. Um, there are going to be people who really don't like this movie. And um, because feelings got really hurt, you know what I mean? And um, there were a lot of hurt feelings involved in the production of this and the the years that passed and, and what became of this. So and we have, you know, I mean, we have educators, social workers, students, film schools, lawyers, lots of lawyers. Um, and we also bought the film. So when you hear Robert, for example, when you I think we filmed Robert for eight hours, you know, Robert England filmed for about eight hours on screen queen. So when you hear him dissecting a scene, it's not only you don't just hear him talk about it. You hear him. You see it because we own the film and um, you see him turn into Freddy Krueger. You see him describing, um, you know, a particular scene and what his feelings were about it. And um, and then it actually the scene he morphs into the scene. And it's all it's all been shot by fashion people. So in New York, so the production quality is really super, super, super high and very, I mean, we're using all kinds of mediums inside of the, uh, you know, CGI, which is like anything that's on the, in the side guys right now in filmmaking is in this documentary. But it's been a long journey. And to be honest with you, at this point, I'm so tired of the story that um, <laughs> I just like, oh, please, no, <laughs> do we have to talk about that again? And I'm just getting into the point where, um, you know, the real talking is going to begin because then we have to, of course, take the film on the road for a year. And um, and we're starting to book, um, you know, we're starting to book uh, film festivals and whatnot now. And um, so I realized, you know, all of 2018 is, you know, it's, it's going to be a, it's going to be about this is what it's going to be about. So um, um, so I'm just girding my loins, as they say. But but I am proud of what I've done. I mean, it's like I, um, you know, and I and I offer that as an, a model to anybody who wants to um, go out into the world, you know, is to like live in your truth, you know what I mean? Because that's what people are really interested in. People are not real. I don't think people are really interested in these kind of canned stories that are uh, like when you like I love there's a there's a lady named Brene Brown who I'm a big fan of. And she talks a lot about um, she's a research scientist, mm -hmm. basically, for emotions. And she talks about shame and a lot of different things, which are very pertinent to all of us. Uh, but she said, you know, it's like she she uses the man in the arena quote, which I've always really loved. And it's like if you're going to go out and put yourself on the line and you're going to take up a controversial position, say, or you're going to tell the, a truth that's your truth. People don't want to see you bulletproof. You know what I mean? They don't want to see you all armored up with all the, hey, you know, I can deflect this. They want to see you get in there and really bleed. You know, because that's what being vulnerable is. If you're going to get out there and you're going to tell your story, you're going to get kicked in the ass on occasion. You know, and I've experienced that. You know, I've, I've, you know, I've gotten kicked in the teeth quite a few times, but I always get back up. You know, and uh, I dust myself off and I go, okay, here we go again. You know, it's like I'm going back in, and that I believe is what people really want to see. Because we all experience that in life, you know, we all want to be, we all want to be victors, you know, we all want to tell our story, you know, and, um, and, but to tell your story on this level, people recognize if it's BS, you know what I mean? They yeah. know, you can tell when somebody's BSing you, oh, yeah. or you can tell when somebody's telling you the truth. And whether you agree with them or not, if they're truthful, it's evocative and, and you want to get in there and you want to. You know, you want to you want to root for them, actually, you know, you want them you want them to win, you know. So. Um, so that's been my experience. I love I love it. I, I was listen, I put up a, a little quote that said something about uh, uh, having fortitude. And the thing is, I always felt like, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street to Jesse, because, you know, I I screen tested 
for the first movie. And um, I always felt like this was my part, like this was my destiny, you know, to play this particular character in this particular movie for these particular reasons. So, and the thing is, it's like, I just believe God doesn't give you anything you can't handle, right? So I, I was built for this shit. You know what I mean? I was built for this confrontation. You know, I can have the conversation and and have fun with it and laugh, but then come in for the kill at the end and say, this is this is what I want you to take away from this. That, you know, like I want to make us all stronger. I don't want it, I don't want any of us to lose in this situation. You know, so that's it. So that's cool. And, Thank and you for bringing up that. Yeah, because everything you talk about with being honest, and I don't know if you've you've been able to see but a lot of things that I like to do with Elm Street Radio here is to have kind of like a fireside chat about things even beyond the movies beyond what we see but what we feel and and the impact and like I mentioned a million times and I will say it a million more about your particular role and I completely agree with that you know people who do things that have never been done before are doing things that have never been done before. Other people can't handle it. They didn't do it. They didn't take on the responsibility. That's something you have. And I think when Scream Queens comes out, it's going to really shake up a lot of film, a lot of perception about the impact of film, a lot of questions about life and how things go on. And of course, you know everything about the documentary, and I'm just kind of shooting here from everything I've learned and, and knowing you and knowing how you approach things and knowing the topics that have been covered surrounding Nightmare 2. I think this is going to be probably one of the greatest documentaries ever made. And I know people will probably initially think, hey, it's in a Nightmare on Elm Street based documentary, but if they were really looking beyond that, they would see that there's something so much deeper. And I do believe that nobody else could have taken on Jesse and really taken that role and brought to it life lessons for thousands and, and, and millions of people all over the world uh, about something so much more than just a movie, so much more than just a horror movie. Like, you, you, I, th I think I, th I think it's really interesting the time that we live in because um, because, you know, we're losing. We're losing an aspect of life that's really important, and some of us are trying to save it. But the, you know, storytelling, you know, sitting around the campfire, which is basically what our phones are now is, you know, there are campfire. Right. And we tell stories to each other and there are lessons in those stories that are really important, you know, and human communication is, is really, really important. Um, and if you can find a common ground to jump out of, like we use um, for Screen Queen, of course, the documentary is about Nightmare on Elm Street, and it's very particularly about me. It's very particularly about a, a time that has come and gone, but um, but interestingly enough, I, I would, I complain all the time, like, why isn't this finished? Why isn't this finished? And, um, you know, I can get pretty anxious about those kind of things, especially after you've done a Kickstarter and those type of things, you know, there's a responsibility to all that. I want to, I want to show people, but with not going, not delving too deeply into the current situation in the world, the documentary Screen Queen has never, is, couldn't be shown at a more pertinent time because i i always say to my younger fans it's like i want you to know your history because if you know your history then you can project what's coming in the future and you can be prepared for it and uh, that was always very abstract you know but now it's not abstract anymore it's like the things that i was talking about four or five years ago are becoming realities again and um you know and we are and for all of us, you know, no matter where you fall on the political spectrum and whether you're gay, straight, lesbian, it doesn't matter what you are. It's like, this is a time in the world for us all to be very awake, no matter what we 
think politically, whether we're Republicans or Democrats or, you know, live in Kentucky or live in Paris or live in New York, this is a very important time. And we all need to be wide awake for it because changes are being made in our name that we need to be aware of. So, and that's what a democracy is. And to have a democracy, you have to be able to talk to each other. If you can't talk to each other, you're screwed, you know? And like, you have to be able to talk to people that you don't agree with, you know, or that you have a different opinion. And you don't have to, to dismiss them as a person totally, just because you don't believe the same thing that they believe, you know? Um, and it's really important to have this conversation right now, especially for young people, because young people don't know, you know, that the, the gifts that have been given to them in, in regards to freedoms in the United States, you know, how lucky we are to be able to make our own choices. And, um, and we don't want anything to happen to that because for, especially for women and young people, it's a very important time to stay awake. You know, you may you don't want people making decisions for you and you don't want to make them for other people either, you know? So, you know, we all have, um, little, I don't know. We all have our wheelhouse that we get in or our silo and say, Oh, I know I'm right, but everybody's a little bit right. And everybody's a little bit wrong, you know? So, um, even if it's hard to admit, <laughs> for- oh, absolutely. oh my God, it's like, you know, uh, it's very, it's very hard. Everything's very polarized right now. You know, it's like, the world is in crisis, you know, and it's like, you want to be right. You know, you want your, your side to win. But the thing is, there aren't any sides, you know, really there's, there's just us, all of us, you know, so, yeah. it, but that's, you know, yeah. so I, so I'm, I'm excited that Scream Queen's going to be coming out now. So maybe it was just the right time, but it is, we do use Nightmare on Elm Street as a metaphor. Uh, and there's plenty of Nightmare on Elm Street in it for anybody who is just a, I mean, we have more trivia than you will ever imagine and backed up with documents from NECA and uh, all the big companies, Warner Brothers. I mean, everybody was involved in this um, from Bob Shea, Wes Craven, a- anybody who had anything to do with the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise that was of any import at that particular time, not a- afterwards, but at in 1985, is involved in this documentary. Wow. And, and their voice, they get to speak. So, um, and they get called onto the carpet too, <laughs> you know, on occasion. So there's some shocked looks on occasion of people are like, wait a minute, you're not saying that to me on film, are you? But it's like, yeah, we are. And like, here's the evidence and how do you how do you like them apples that's matt damon <laughs> <laughs> how do you like them apples? i love that yeah here you go so it's be, and it's and it's also it is in good spirit too so yeah yeah which starts to bring me to some of the fan questions that i have here oh. this um this one's from amber knapp and she is asking about scream queen and how you made a trip down memory lane and I know we've kind of expanded upon this, but are there any memories or stories that when you started to talk about it that stuck out? Is there anything that you can tell us right now that won't be making anybody upset by giving us a little bit of insight into uh, Scream Queens or a little bit of a teaser of what to, to come? Oh, thanks. Well, first of all, I love Amber. So thank you for the question, Amber. She's a little, Amber's a, a wonderful fan and friend. So... Um, well, you know, the, I think the, the thing that I could tell your uh, listeners that was probably the most um, heartbreaking um, realization that I had in the making of this, and it was a long heartbreak. Do you know what I mean? It was a long um, journey making this film. Is um, I didn't realize how brokenhearted I was, you know? Um, And I didn't realize the magnitude of what I'd given up. Um, You know, because I'm one of those people who's kind of like, oh, you know, doors just open for me. And which is true, they do, but I work tremendously hard, you know? And I always have been a worker. So, so yes, the door's open, but I'm prepared when the door opens, you know, to walk through it. But I didn't realize, you know, and it was, I had to have many people point it out to me that, that when I walked away from show business, I was a breath away from being a real true movie star. 
And, um, and I had a tendency to beat myself up for not having enough courage um, to walk through the door that I could have walked through in 1986 or 1987. And, but you know what the thing is, I, I have some compassion for myself too, because you know what, I just couldn't. And, you know, I'm human. So, you know, if I had it to do over again, of course, I, I'd go like, you know, screw you all, get out of my way. You know, I'm better than you are and I'll, you know, I'll show you all. Um, but I didn't have that in me at the time, you know? And so, and that's a regret. You know, it's a sad, I mean, I look at some of my friends, you know, who are tremendously wealthy and tremendously powerful. And, uh, you know, they were my peers. So, and they still are my peers in some ways, but I look at old friends, you know, having dinner at the White House and I go like, oh, that could have been me, (laughs) you know, (laughs) but it wasn't, you know. So, I think it could be Mark though, but because everything you've told me, I I absolutely think that you could have that happen to you. I definitely do. Well, do you remember when you and I used to talk about a um, uh, long time ago, I'll, I'll pull your fans in on, you know, D and I have a relationship. So we have a long, I've watched her turn from a young chick into a very powerful woman. So, but we used to talk about, we used to make fun of like, I was going to make a musical called, um, a, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street, the musical starring. Oh, yeah. And I would like have to, you know, I would knock off Heather or tie her up in the closet so I could play her part. And we always talked about doing this radio show called Stock, Stock Talk. And it was about stalkers, you know, like people who were stalkers and like stalker fans. And I always wanted to have like a, a, a talk show where, you know, you talk to horror people about deeper issues, right? Like what, just exactly what you're doing now, which I think is fantastic. Do you know what I mean? Because like people like, uh, if you can draw them out, like I know you had Mandy, you interviewed her not too long ago and uh, Amanda Wiss. And, you know, Amanda has a fabulous story to tell, you know? And I mean, she really does. It's like, uh, you know, she's a survivor for sure. And uh, it was funny when I was, when we were going through the, the uh, I just sent her an email because when we were going through like the archives and stuff, I found a picture of her and my lover, uh, Tim, uh, who passed away a long, long time ago. But she and Tim had done uh, a sitcom together. And, you know, and I lived with Tim when he did this sitcom. And of course, I didn't know Amanda. Um, and I think like all these years later, you know, there's Amanda Wiss, like right around the corner. And that's our little six degrees of separation. And, and um, I think it's interesting to know what it takes to, you know, take the journey that she took. So, you know, in her point of view on, on the world, because she's had quite a resurgence, I think. I think she's doing really, really good. I do, too. I think Amanda's definitely out there. And I, I worry, you know, I, I, I want to highlight everything that you're talking about because I do remember that stock talk now. I think I might have discovered the um, the poster that I drew for the, uh, the the musical we talked about where it was in the style of I Am Nancy and it had the, the coffee pot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then, oh, I, I have it. You're in my memory books. It's like I have the, like, um, the one that you have. I put glitter all over it. Like, oh, I, my I, God. <laughs> I keep very, very few things. You know what I mean? But no, and, and I didn't bring up Stock Talk for, I mean, I brought actually brought up Stock Talk for another reason, because I really do feel that maybe my future lies in, in um, speaking about, you know, as a, a speaker of some sort or something. To, you know, in some organization or something, because I enjoy that a lot. I learned to do that doing the Q&A's and stuff. But no, I love the idea that like when friends get together and, you know, we had a a friendship and a mentorship and we had a lot of different things going on when you were a younger girl. And but I love to see that these seeds, they get planted. That's 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 what mentorship is all about. You know, is like these little seeds get planted in your mind here and there and here and there. And then somebody realizes them, you know, and here you are realizing that thing. And I, I'm thrilled about it. I think it's amazing. You know, um, it's, it's the way it should be, you know, 
Yeah. And I know for sure that you, without a doubt, have been an influential force in my life. And as I was telling you before, you know, all the, all the horror, everything I do in the horror world has really influenced what I ended up doing in my life. And without a doubt, Mark, you have been one of the integral forces in, in keeping me going. Oh, well, that's sweet. Well, your dad, you got your dad too. But, uh, you know, it's like, yes, it informs everything that you do. You learn to be a survivor through Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, it's true. And you um, have times and you had to like, you had to face up to your critics and you had to stand your ground and say, you know what, you can think whatever you want, but this is who I am. And I'm not going to let you stop me from doing what I want to do. Yeah. And that's a, that's what a survivor does. You know, somebody said to me the other day, they said, how do you feel about, because they do this metaphor in the, in in the documentary too is to really what is the final girl who is the final girl in um you know in in a horror film what part does she play right and she outwits her oppressor you know hopefully (laughs) and she survives you know and she has to do a lot of different things she has to fight she has to be cunning all those kind of things and you know i'm the final girl in nightmare on elm street so I, that's, you know, I'm the final boy and that's been my journey. You know, this has been the the roadmap of my journey and my real life is I survived this. I'm, I'm, I'm the final boy, you know, so, and I'm still standing. So that's what a survivor is. And that's what you are too. So thanks, Mark. I have a couple of other questions for you from some of your fans and then, oh gosh, I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to keep you too long because I know that it's it's a, it's a trend on Elm Street Radio to talk for a very long time because the subjects that we delve into are so deep we're, so we're okay. we might have to break this into a part 2 and I know that you know if you want to speak to some of your your colleagues through here and have your own little segment through Elm Street Radio for that honesty. I I know everybody would love to hear that. And I would love to hear that if that's ever something you're interested in, I'm just throwing it out on the table. But um, I, I, you know what, I'm I'm probably going to come back and say yes, that's a that's a very sweet offer. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. All right. So here's one from (laughs) at H a horror cast or half assed horror cast on Twitter. They ask what modern horror franchise would you most be interested in being part of? Oh, without a doubt. It's like, like, first of all, I would like to be in a streaming content uh, um, environment as opposed to film, because I like long form storytelling. Um, I, I have a friend who's been on um, The Young and the Restless or All My Children, one of those, I can't remember which when he's on, but he's been on for like 25 years playing this same character. And a lot of people are like, oh my God, that would drive you crazy. For me, I would love that. Um, I Not so much on a soap, but hands down for me right now would be, I would have loved to be involved in American horror story. Um, I think it's amazing. But I also have, you know, me, I'm always the entrepreneur. And I, and I think, um, you know, the, War- the WB has, a Warner Brothers has a lot of money invested in Nightmare on Elm Street, and um, they own this property. And I think um, if I could be in any horror franchise, I'd actually like to be in Nightmare on Elm Street again. But I would like to do it like they do, um, like Ryan Murphy does, with uh, um, like a 10-episode story arc for... Um, each different characters, like uh, newly realized characters. But I would like to make, I would like them to go back to Elm Street being very, very dark. And um, also that, that, that Freddy, because as you know, like in Nightmare on Elm Street too, Freddy only played, you know, he's only in 12 minutes of the movie. So um, he's always present, but his actual presence is only 20, 12 minutes of screen time and really make an emphasis on the characters, you know, that are being um, stalked by him. I think it could be, you know, like like an allegory. I think it could be really beautiful because it would be a shame to lose um, that character, you know, I mean, really. 
I it's, feel the same way. Yeah, I don't think it should just die. I think it has so much potential because the idea of Freddie and what he represents is universal and it's not just limited to one era, but there's so much more to be explored in this this I theme. Mean, I, I am really surprised. I mean, there are so many, like we were joking about Nightmare on Elm Street, the musical, but um, Nightmare on Elm Street would actually make a fabulous opera, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I'm serious. It would like because it has everything. Do you know what I mean? It really has the absurdity of opera, the huge story telling vehicles and the characters and everything. So yeah, I just don't think that's played out. But so that's what I would do. I would like to do that. But I also would like American Horror Story is, uh, and you never know. You might see me on there too. I'd like I'll just say that for the fun of it. But um, the that's the the series and because especially because kathy who's a friend of mine kathy bates you know is so involved in that series that um um i just think it's brilliant but i think almost anything he does is brilliant so you hear that yeah, world that. you better get mark Patton on there you would i think you would knock that out of the park really <laughs> well they if they'll yeah. have me and matt if they'll have me and Matt Bomer back, I'll be more than happy to come. And that would be really cool if you were. And I actually have just one quick question going back to um, all the way Days of the Dead Indie 2011 when there, when you were on the Scream Queens panel and Lucas had called in and asked about how the, the sequel to the remake was going to be. And you mentioned something about a possibility of Jesse being in it. What, how would you feel if they did do a new Nightmare reboot and they did have a character that was either named Jesse or or representative of Jesse? And I, what would you think about that? And would you like them to be in that same sort of vein? Would you kind of become the mentor to him and, and help him develop that and, and see the deeper meaning in the character's role? Well, you know, it, it's actually, I think that if they were to reboot, uh, Elm Street as a uh, again, I think they'd be foolish a not to do part two, and um, because it really is the most character driven of all of them, and they could correct like a couple of little mistakes that always bothered people. Like one of the mistakes we talk about this in the documentary is like where I always thought that they should at the pool scene when Freddie kills everybody at the pool that at the very end, there should have been a shot of me covered in blood, uh, Ooh, Jesse should have been. Yeah. So that everybody would think that Jesse was the person in the real world that killed him. And that would have plugged that hole, right? That's a simple plug of the hole because then you'd see the dreams as the dream. And also in the end, I was supposed, like if you read Jesse's Lost Journals, which you should, because we just republished it again. Um, and, and we're getting ready for the next one to come out. The, um, is that, you know, really Jesse should have killed Lisa. And um, and that's how, what I always thought. Like, I think that's a mistake. That's a hubris of people remaking things is they don't talk to people. It's a mistake they made in the first one. They don't talk to people who know the source material really well and have had a lot of time to think about it, like decades. So I always thought that the the really the most interesting thing to do would have been to, um, which I think is what they were plotting, but then Wes sort of came back in and, and nixed it, was that, um, that that Heather inhabited, the Nancy inhabited the dream world, right? And, um, and Jesse was the interlocutor into the real world. And if those two would combine forces, Nancy and Jesse, they could have trapped Freddie someplace where he couldn't have Oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah, and see, like we would know that because we've had a long, long time to think about these things, you know what I mean? And I think that would be a wonderful, do you know what I mean? And also because socially it's a different time, you know, that you really could deal with, if you wanted to deal with the aspect of, oh, it's supposed to be a kid coming out, you could actually really deal with that, you know? And there are like all kinds of gags that they, they just didn't take, which I, you know, I always say the big mistake in that whole movie is they didn't, make me sleep in the closet. I should have, you know, that would have been, you know, and then my mom's trying to pull me out. Come out. Come out of the know? closet, Jesse. You'll be okay if you get out of the, but I, the only place I would feel safe 
from Freddie was if I was in the closet, you know, those, see, I can offer those kind of insights into things because I, you know, I lived with this movie for 30 years, but, uh, so I, you know, I'm, I think if they should, I, I hope they do it again. And I hope that they don't let 20 year olds do it or 25 year olds roll the train. You don't need to use every new thing in the world to capture a new audience. You can, you know, you can use some of the old school stuff and, you know, start a trend that way. But I think we're losing, you know, in, in all of the computers and everything, we're really losing the humanity of these things. And, and that's why people like 80s horror so much is because it's human, you know? It's like, I think the best kill in Nightmare on Elm Street of the entire series, the one that's the most scary to me, is Grady's death. Because, like, I'll tell you a story. I was on the train the other day and I was going to the airport or to go to somewhere. I don't know where I was going. But the thing is, I can't do carry-on luggage because I have a really good glove. So my glove always has to be checked, right? And um, so it costs me an extra like $150 every time I come to a show. So, because I have to put that underground stuff. But I had my hair dyed blue, right? And I was looking really cute with some blue hair. And I was on the train and it was early in the morning and this guy kind of gave me the skank eye, right? Like. That's the way I perceived it. And I thought very quickly that he would change his tune. It was about six o'clock in the morning. I thought he picked, I had my glove in my bag. I could have just reached in my bag, put my glove, which is an Anders glove. Made headlines. And yeah, (laughs) and I could have stabbed him and killed him just like Grady got killed. And I would have been, you know, headline news all around the world. And I thought, thank God I'm sane because I could like just off that dude. And that I think you can really relate to. It's like being alone in the room with your friend and all of a sudden your friend, what a nightmare, you know, to be in the bedroom of your girlfriend or your boyfriend or whoever. And you're like, you're having a good night, but you're having a rough time. And then you wake up and your friend's dead. I don't think it really gets any more scary than that. No. You know, because you don't know if you really killed them or somebody else killed them, or you're going to jail or you're, you know, that's a night, that would be a nightmare to me. Yeah. And how that ending, how, you know, Jesse's there in the mirror screaming at Freddy and and I just, it's gut wrenching. That movie is emotional on so many levels, but I think we're going to go ahead and uh, let you head back to Chicago. We will take you away from Elm Street for now, but like I mentioned, we would love to have you on again, Mark. Oh, well, thank you. I would, I would love to do that. Maybe we can hook up some neat little conversations. And when you're in Chicago, come and say hi to me, okay? So we'll go out to dinner or something. I would love that, Mark. I would absolutely love that. So before we go, uh, or at least before I let you go, would you be able to say some of the uh, upcoming conventions that people might be able to catch you at? Oh, sure. Uh, thank you for asking. I'm going to Crypticon in uh, Kansas City, St. Joe, um, next week, I guess it's the 15th or something like that. And then I'm going to flame con in New York, uh, which is in, uh, Brooklyn this year at a big, it's a huge gay and lesbian convention. It's really great. If you're in New York, go to it. It's, it's off the charts. And then I'm going to, let's see where I'm going to, I'm going to be in Sacramento and I can't remember the name of the show right now. And then my big jaunt this year is for your listeners who are really fun is I'm going to um, Birmingham uh, in the UK, London at the Prince Charles Theatre, to Paris at the Clive Barker Bookstore and uh, Dublin and Berlin and someplace else. And that's October and um, most of November I'll be in Europe. And then, um, and then I'm going to be at the Syracuse Film Festival. They're doing a Nightmare on Elm Street Film Festival. And I'll be in Louisville, Kentucky at a Benefit for uh, the Trevor Project and Bullying in Louisville in August. So that's just some of them. But you can visit me on um, uh, Facebook, of course. And the, the Facebook, I have number, numerous Facebook pages. But the one that if you really want to have fun with me is, um, is a friend page. It's Mark Patton. And it is, I'm trying to think what I look like on that one. I'm like sitting down in a chair or something. So there, I think there are six or seven because of the 5,000 limit thing. And of course, now a lot of them are run um, by people who are helpful to me, like Screaming Queen or whatnot. But my real Facebook page is, it only has a few thousand people on it. So we weeded it out. So, you know, you could actually be friends there if you wanted and have conversations. 
And um, then my, my, my big thing now is Instagram. And I really in, invite you to join me there. It's at uh, Mark Patton, N-O-E-S-2. And that's fun. I mean, you find out about things that I like. And there's a lot of Nightmare on Elm Street and horror. But there's also really cute guys. And there's like art projects and just, you know, my take on the world. And we also are selling a lot of merchandise now. So, and it's really easy to get your hands on uh, like very limited edition t-shirts and that, stuff like that that are off the beaten path, you know? So if you like the um, Nancy boy t-shirts or the, you know, Jesse, let's keep this. He's inside me stuff between us. That's, that's your shop to go to. Cause that's the kind of stuff we do, which is a little more subversive and fun and, and, and just a little different. So. Well, thank anyway, you, Mark. It. That was, that was wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Check that out. Keep your eyes out for Scream Queen. And uh, once again, thank you so much for being with us, Mark. Okay, good night, Dee. Thank you so much. Bye. <sighs> wow. That was beyond what I even expected of, of Mark. Um, he is... He leaves me speechless every time I not only talk to him, but hear anything he puts out. I very much admire him as a person. I think what Mark has is very rare. And especially being somebody who is in the spotlight, Mark keeps that human element to him. But he's also very honest and he's also very true to himself. I think that's something that's really interesting because I'm a marketer and I've even had my own experience with dipping my toes and becoming a brand but you can become a brand but you don't have to try to become a brand you just be yourself and in that way you'll build your own brand but not in a negative way not like an artificial brand but in a way that's that's honest and I think Mark is the epitome of what you hope for from an interaction from somebody you admire but also just as a person, how he approaches things. You know, he's not fearless, he's courageous in that he, it's like when Wes was talking about Nancy and how Mark was talking about survivors, you know, you get knocked down and you have these negative things, but you come right back up and you are stronger than before when, than, than when you first talked about it. And you don't want to hide behind something because then that's not true to you. And Mark is certainly... A role model and I, I hope you guys have had the pleasure of talking to him and if not I highly encourage you to reach out because Mark is an extremely personable gentleman and I hope you will visit him at a convention if you have the opportunity and tell him how he has influenced you and go out there and check out Scream Queens and and go to all these amazing places that he's going to I see only the brightest future for Mark continuously. He came and he didn't really know much what was going on. Other people had had all this experience, but Mark took it, made it his own and figured things out. And he's just an incredible guy. He's incredible. And I keep saying that stuff over and over again, but I really mean it. And um, I wish him the best. So... Next week, Elm Street fans, I believe, is the week of the 12th, if I, my memory serves me correctly, the wizard master himself from Dream Warriors. Looking forward to talking to Ira. And if you have any questions for him, please let us know, and we will be sure to do our best to get those in there. And until next time, Elm Street fans, remember, whatever you do, don't fall asleep. Thanks for listening to Elm Street Radio. This is Deandra signing off. <laughs>